Hello and welcome to The Hard Questions. I'm Solomon Serwanja. Uganda's Finance Minister, Matia Kasaija, unveiled to all of us a budget for the financial year 2023-2024. That, of course, is at a tune of 52.7 trillion shillings. About 29.7 trillion shillings will be coming from your taxes that will be collected by the Uganda Revenue Authority. And about 3.2 trillion shillings will be coming from internal debt. That means government will be going to the commercial banks to borrow this money. And the rest will be coming from external funding, including loans and grants. So what does this budget mean for you? Does it really address our issues? Where are the allocations? Is government taking us seriously with the appropriation? We'll also speak to, is the money going to be put to good use? I speak to economists and the executive director of the Federation of Small and Medium Enterprises, Mr. John Walugembe. John, thank you so much for accepting to speak to us. Thank you, Solomon, for having me here. It's always a pleasure to speak to you. Great, John. Let's start with, what do you make of this budget? Well, it's a budget that does not fundamentally differ from the previous budgets. The priorities remain the same. It's about boosting household incomes and supporting microenterprises. It's about boosting private sector growth. It's about improving the stock of infrastructure. And it's about bringing uh, the people in subsistence agriculture, the 39% into the money economy. So in terms of those priorities, I would say they've remained uh, fundamentally the same. And maybe the viewers must appreciate that since uh, the new Finance Management Act uh, that was passed in 2015, uh, we already know what's in the budget, so it's basically no surprise because you know it's approved by budget by parliament before we have the discussions before so you very much know what's in the budget before it's read by the minister yeah but john perhaps before we get into this uh, new budget for the next financial year which actually we're just counting down a day or so to start the next financial year we always don't look at the performance of the concluding budget and like you've said most of the priorities are the same not a lot has changed how would you score government in terms of the implementation of the budget and the budget performance at large? I think the minister tries, when, when he comes, uh, before he delves into the new budget, he tries to paint a picture of how they performed the previous year. Of course, we may dispute some of the figures. For instance, uh, when he was reading, he said that the meter gauge delay was complete, and then the speaker had to correct him and say, oh, sorry, it's not yet complete. So. That makes us doubt some of the other figures that he may have shared, but in, he does share, for instance, on Emioga, which concerns a lot of micro-businesses. He said that uh, through Emioga, they have mobilized about 76 billion, and they have uh, saved about 80, uh, they have recovered about 80 billion, which would be good performance. And that begs the question, why allocate more money if something is working well? Maybe that's something he has to answer, but he, he explains it. He talked about the issue of inflation. He said inflation has come down to about 6.2% from the peak of about 10.2%. You know, so he tries to indicate where he thinks uh, movement has been made. We may dispute and say, well, we are not sure that has been the performance, but at least he tries to explain uh, where he thinks uh, government has made progress. And the budget continuously grows, right? Um, it has grown, right, from 2017 when it was about 22 trillion. It kept on growing to about 44 trillion. And now we have moved for, to 52.7 trillion. Does that reflect our economy growing at the same time? Well, the estimation is that the economy is about 162 trillion. So it's definitely, there's no uh, question that, that the economy is growing. Uh, the economy growing does not mean that the budget needs to necessarily grow. You know, it's like in your home, just because you've got a better job doesn't mean your expenditure has to grow. You can say, I'll live within my means and then I'll, I'll save the surplus. But we seem to be, you know, the budget seems to be growing. And part of the issue is our expenditure priorities, but also our appetite for debt is very high. Uh, so in this budget, we are about 17 trillion is going towards uh, debt uh, servicing. And you, you know that President mentioned that, he, I mean, he's equally concerned and said now for, to contract any new loans, I'm, I'm the one to approve. 
that shows that uh, it's concerning. Uh, of course, efforts have been made to reduce what we call the debt to GDP ratio. Because if you go to the bank to borrow, they'll say, we cannot give you a loan. You cannot have loans, for instance, that take three quarters of your salary because how will you live? You know? So in countries, they have what they call the debt to GDP ratio. They want to see of the money you make, how much of it is debt. And we are now at 48.2. Yeah. You know, of course, the technocrats, the government, the governments are saying, well, it's okay, look at Fair so and moderate. so, look at so and so, but. Look at within the region. Yeah, we say, oh, look at Kenya, but Tanzania is doing well. DRC, I think, is equally doing well. So I think we need to moderate this appetite for debt, in my, in my view. Yeah. John, l l let's talk about debt a little bit uh, deeper. Uganda's debt stood at about 80.8 .8 trillion shillings. That was equivalent to about $21 billion at the end of December 2022. Yes. Now, it is projected that it will grow to about 88.9 trillion by, by the end, end of this of month. Financial... No, two, two, two days from now. Yeah, two days from now, by the end of uh, June. Yes. It will be at about 88.9 trillion. Yes. That's quite a big number. Yes, yes, and it's worrisome. About 47% of it is external debt. Then about 33 trillion uh, is coming. Internal debt, yes. In, in, internal debt. So our appetite, it speaks to our appetite to borrow. It speaks to appetite to borrow. And I think government is now uh, adopting a, a, a policy of what we call fiscal consolidation. That means you cut expenditure. It's like if you, if you get a notice that you're going to lose your job, you say, OK, where will I get money? And then how do I chop my expenses? So that's what government is trying to do. How do I reduce expenditure while increasing my uh, revenue? So that's the task that government uh, has at the moment. Uh, if we are to look at, are they making headway? I think, you know, they say that if this fiscal consolidation is to work, there are other conducive factors. It, it cannot work in isolation. You know? So you have to look at the enabling environment. Businesses have to be growing because how are you going to grow your revenue if businesses are not growing? If you know, if you because it's a chicken and egg question. If you're too tight uh, in your efforts to raise revenue, then you could strangle uh, businesses. And then if you strangle businesses, then you can't really raise the revenue. So you find yourself in a catch at 22. But the easier bit is to reduce expenditure. And here, I would say government is trying, but it keeps saying the same things. Eh? Last budget, they said, well, we're cutting down on workshops. We are cutting down on travel abroad. Uh, we are cutting down on uh, the purchase of new vehicles. Same thing this year. Can't we, are there additional areas in which we can save money? And I would propose, for instance, that the long awaited rationalization of government agencies should proceed. It has now been pushed by here. Yeah. Why? In any case, new agencies are being pro uh, proposed. Now there's a, a proposed agency on the Food and Drug Authority, you know? So not only are they, we are failing to reduce, in, instead we are simply increasing. So I think that's where the hard work is. It's tough, but that's where the hard work is. There is also the reduction of the expense on, uh, on uh, public administration. Obviously, for political reasons, it's also very hard to say. This is a district we are now closing. Yeah? We no longer have Butalija district, for instance, or we no longer have, um, uh, I don't know, any of these other districts. But can, even within you know, those districts, are in there areas in which you can save costs? I think there are, and we should consider them. Yeah, but John, let, let, let me just stick a little bit to the public debt, because you see, we all run families. So when you know how much money you earn, yes. you then plan to spend within your means. Yes. Imagine if you have to run your family on a big loan, and you're saying the sustainability of my family is literally half, I'm, I'm sustaining it on loans. Remember when you go to the bank, you have to get collateral, right? So if you fail to pay, you know, there must be security and there's guarantee before they give you that money. And, and because we have refused to cut on our expenditure to live within our means, we end up going back to borrow. And that means that we actually put ourselves in very terrible, situations. Uganda is heavily indebted to China, for example. 
Well, it's having indebted if, to. If you look, if you look at the numbers, actually, the Chinese debt is wouldn't be. I wouldn't rank it uh, the, the, the the biggest. But in, the issue is that there is we have a debt issue, irrespective of to who we are borrowing left, right, and center. And you see, the more you borrow, the more you you may end up because you may run out of options. Because ideally, na nations like us should contract what they call a sovereign debt, or you know concessional loans and stuff like that. Because if I'm a country, it's better I borrow from the World Bank, I borrow from the IMF, I borrow from the African Development Bank, I borrow from the Islamic Development Bank, you know? If I start borrowing from private entities, like Argentina did, like some of these other countries have done, you put yourself in very slippery uh, ground. And I think Uganda is tending in that direction, you know, because uh, you, you, at some point you start exhausting uh your 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 options and then you start resorting to it's like you you know you can borrow from a bank at some point a commercial bank will say no uh solomon we can't lend you money then you go to a money lender and when you go to a money lender they charge you interest at 120 percent and they are sure you won't pay you know so i think as you contract this debt we really have to be careful of the source the preference is to go with concessional loans. But let's go with non-concessional loans as, as giving you an example. Yes, it's good, but we have had non-concessional loans before. We go to who you call the money shops. And like, for example, at, at a country level, Uganda's debt to China is big. And, and you said it's not, it's no, not I something wouldn't. to worry. I wouldn't, but I wouldn't. I, that I, would I, not be the starting point. I don't think, it, it, Historical, because some of these loans were contracted in the 80s, in the 70s and so on. We are still servicing them. You know? So historically, the Chinese debt is quite recent. That's my point. It, it is. What I was trying to build up is because countries that have been heavily indebted to, to such countries have had consequences to that. We know that here in Uganda, there are conversations of the Chinese taking over the entire well, international there's also, and of course the conversations There is also where, geopolitical competition between the West and China. And the West is trying to project China in bad light. They're trying to say Chinese debt is bad. China is engaged in debt diplomacy, loading African countries with so much debt that they cannot recover. Then they are sponsoring stories. Oh, China has taken over the airport in Zambia. China is going to take over the airport in Zambia. So I think we must also appreciate Mombasa. that. We must also appreciate that there's also a geopolitical struggle between the West and China, and the West, because they control the narrative, have an interest in projecting China in negative light. I'm not saying China is an angel. I'm simply saying we need to look at the issue squarely. Justifiably as it is, John, you're an economist. Ah, Numbers yes, I don't lie. Yes, so yes, I am. You've got the money, you have to pay it back. You fail to pay it. Yeah, the but my point is, if you look at the aggregate debt Uganda has secured since independence, we've borrowed more from the West than from China. And that's a fact. So f what I'm simply saying is that the recent hula balu about China and it creating some kind of debt distress situation for African countries is due to the geopolitical tensions between China and the West. Yes, China has its own challenges, but uh, ultimately, we need to look at debt as debt. And I think we trust uh, the people who contract our debt to be smart enough to look at the conditions and only contract that debt that is in our interest. Mm. And, and that's important. It reminds me of people who said they signed debt agreements without even reading the entire uh, entire That's our problem because we are send, if we are sending dumb people to contract on our behalf, then it's a problem. We can't blame the Chinese because the Chinese have been able to build themselves into the world's second biggest economy because they are building a, a, a system built on meritocracy. So if we want as Uganda to grow our economy, it means we must also have smart people, smart lawyers who sit, read the agreements, ask questions, are able to push our interests to the limit. Yeah. Uh, uh, let's stay on that a little bit because one of the measures that Matia Kasadia proposes is that to really reduce on our debt burden but also to effectively pay. And like you said, we're spending about 17 trillion shillings for this financial year alone to debt repayment. But we'll get to that. But this is what he proposes. Ensure effective implementation of domestic revenue mobilization strategy by URA so that we're able to collect enough revenue to fund our budget. He also suggests that there should be reduction on expenditure in areas of low priority in order 
to support fiscal consolidation. I think you mentioned about that earlier. He also says that there should be access to new sources of financing, including climate and green financing, leverage private equity and promote uh, public-private partnerships. Um, and he also talks about limit on non-concessional debt to high impact. And therefore, the investment that we get from debt should be able to com commensurate to the return on investment, like construction of industrial, uh, parks, power transmission lines, water for production and tourism, and therefore it will be looked at as a uh, great investment. And of course, lastly, is reduce on domestic borrowing. Your thoughts on that strategy? Well, the strategy is good. I think the challenge with Uganda is that we say the right things. So you can't look at that budget and you fault the minister for saying the wrong thing. Because whereas in practice, he's the one who will bring on 5th July a supplementary budget. In the actual budget, he will say, we want to limit supplementary budget. So what you see is that the action, and there's a disparity between the action and the talk. And I think that's where the issue is. You know, We must tell ourselves these things that we write that make sense. If we say we want, because, and sometimes they use flurry language. So when they say we want to implement the domestic revenue mobilization strategy, it means more taxes. That's what minister is saying, we are going to tax you more so that you get more money. But we also want government, because he's not mentioned cutting wasteful expenditure. Yeah. Because if you're talking about fiscal consolidation, it cannot be one-sided. You must also cut wasteful expenditure. expenditure. But also, but you, must, but also you must invest a little money you, correct, you, 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 you generate correctly and in the right areas. You see, if you have a job, and every time you get a salary, you go out for a party, you call your friends, you go out for a party. Yes, it's expenditure, but it's not the best use of your money because tomorrow, when you have an issue, you won't have created an additional source of income. So we are asking government, look, this money that, okay, let's try to interrogate last year's budget. Yes, you are a collected 21 trillion, maybe by the end of this, by the end of two, two days from now, they'll have collected 25 trillion. Okay, how have we deployed it? These businesses that are paying you taxes, what, what is in it for them? What are they benefiting? You can't just say, oh, you know, when you go to a hospital, you'll find Panadol, there'll be a good road here. There. That's, those are general benefits. The businesses that pay tax need more support in order to be able to pay more tax. That's the whole point. Just, just like any other business person who is smart uh, would do. If you have... Uh, workers that are making for you money, invest in them so that they are able to make for you even more money. That's the logic. We are not saying that these people should be helped as a sense of altruism or government should be philanthropic to support businesses and stuff. No, we are saying it's so, as government, it's in your interest to support businesses because if businesses succeed, if businesses are compliant, if businesses pay more tax, then we are all good. Yeah, and you've talked about taxing because URA has to collect 29.7 trillion shillings from the taxpayers. I, I wanted, and then of course they have proposed different measures, uh, including, by the way, um, they have talked about different measures like deductions allowed to accelerate a wear and tear on plants and machinery, and those should... The, that should be reinforced. Then exemption of VAT on diapers, inputs of processing hides and skins into finished leather, and input into iron ore, smelting into uh, into the different products need to, like that that tax needs to be brought back. And then of course they suggested value added tax. Um, they are they are, they are they are saying that they are going to. In, put like some money, uh, of course they talked about 10% 10%, um, 10 uh, tax on people, commission agents and all that. So you are is anyway trying to look at every way of squeezing uh, the population to get as much money as they can so that they can be able to actually meet their tax, so their tax targets the target, of uh, 29.7 trillion. And that's very delicate, especially with a fragile economy. Yeah, so first of all, I want to say that the Ministry of Finance has also tried to be fair. Since COVID, they've avoided introducing any significant tax measures. If you look at those tax measures, they are corrective in nature. They are, maybe one person was entitled to an exemption and another wasn't, so they are trying to balance. Eh? So for instance now, uh, you can, uh, 
you you can you can get relief for people who spend who borrow from my, previously for people who um, borrow from mainstream commercial banks they would get an allowable expense as they as they are filing their returns eh? for that expense on interest and things like that but for people who borrow from microfinance institutions they wouldn't so they've corrected that mm -hmm. so if you look at some of the, most of those measures they are simply correcting those kinds of uh, imbalances. So and are, those new tax measures are only bringing about 600 billion. So it means that the bulk of the five or four point something trillion that URA wants to collect extra to what it has collected this year has to come through existing measures, primarily VAT. Uh, they'll also try to make sure they are strict around issues, digital stamps. They'll try to make sure they are more stringent around IFRIS and so on so that they can follow the money trail. So businesses have to tighten their belts. What, is this, what does this mean for SMEs? Well, it means that SMEs, to a certain extent, have to put their house in order because URA will not listen to stories and so on. Because for them, they have a target. They are not the ones who set these targets. It's the minister and government that says, we want this amount. So URA has to do everything in its power to collect that money. Our appeal to URA is that do not um, do not score an own goal. Because if you're too tough with businesses unnecessarily in a bid to hit your targets, you may be making it difficult for you to hit your targets three or four or five years from now. But you know someone can say, well, I don't care about what will happen in five years. Let me hit my target now. Let me get a bonus. We'll see what happens. But my appeal to them is to do that. But the most important thing is businesses have to try to put their house in order, especially VAT registered companies. It's going to be a tough ride this year. You had mentioned that it is important for SMEs also to align themselves and get the right paperwork to also tap into government opportunities. Of and that also comes with tax compliance. Of course, because you see, if you look at 52 trillion shillings, I would say 60 to 70% of this money goes towards the procurement of products and of services and goods and so on. So in whichever business you are, chances are you tap into this money, either directly or indirectly. So how do you better position yourself? Maybe you are earning money from the fifth in line, from the person who gets money from government. Why don't you position yourself so that you're able to pick money directly from government? Now they have made everything in. There's now an e-procurement system, e-government procurement. You go there, you put your tin, you put your details, you put your what. When they are bidding, everyone sees. That does not mean that there will not be corruption, but it will be more difficult for people to organize their deals around you. So I would urge all SMEs to you know, try to, because the more you hide, because if you hide and because you don't pay taxes, it means you're also hiding away from opportunities. That is the implication. Yeah, because this is to get a government contract, you must get... Everything must be in line. Like, everything must be in everything line. Everything must be in line. So uh, that's what, that would be my appeal to small business owners. Because you're lucky if you can survive without getting any work from government. But most people have to, in one way or the other, benefit from government. So that's what, that's what I would urge them to do. They shouldn't just complain. Because, you know, it's issue of whining, whining, whining all the time. Yes, there's room to whine. Yes, as a federation, you're also there to articulate your issues to make sure that um, that the policy is fair to you. But we must also look you in the eye and say, you know what, although we tell government this and this, but also you. Clean your house. Clean your house, that's it. And it's us, because of course government can say, SMEs are informal, blah, blah, blah. But for us as your representatives, there are also things we need to tell you and say, you know what, please. That actually reminds me of the funding that government puts in the Uganda Development Bank, yes. the Microfinance Support Center, yes. the, uh, you, uh, and, and all these other o o institutions where government feels that this money goes directly in supporting yes. those into the SME sector. And yet, many of them do not qualify to actually get access to this funding. Well, I think it's a two-way kind of thing. One, uh, there are programs that are clear, you know, they are well designed, every SME that, that qualifies. You know, there's the, if, you, if you put aside 100 billion or 200 billion, SMEs that have issues that need to work are so many. 
So inevitably, some people will lose out. But people should lose out squarely. They should feel I was given a chance, I applied, I went through the process, I didn't fulfill this, I didn't fulfill that. Next time, I'll try again. See? But the challenges come if people feel that there's an opaque process I don't understand. All requirements that are meant to fail them. You see? And that is the challenge. That, that's, that's, those are the challenges sometimes you've had in the Mioga where you see a bit of politicization and so on. But I think they've been trying to clean up now. Uh, of course, they reported good figures to the minister. I cannot vouch for them. But it, let's take, if we take it at face value, it means the MEGA program is working. We've not seen the statistics from UDB, you know, because I UDB, think UDB was praised by the Minister of Finance for doing very well. Yeah, but how do you praise without a report? You know, because if, if you're a minister and you come and you say, please give, allow us to appropriate this amount, and then don't give us a proper report to show this is the performance of them, and this is who they've lent, because it's the public money. You can't say now they are doing very well. We, we can't really trust that. But let's hope that certain businesses are benefiting. And to the extent that certain businesses are benefiting, the economy is, is benefiting. The same with the small business recovery. I think overall it shows government desires to support businesses. Mm -hmm. That's what I can say. Maybe it's the, the challenge comes around the implementation of some of these programs. But generally speaking, you see an intention to support, to resuscitate, to uh, help grow the private sector in this country. Yeah, and, and that's where the taxes come from. Definitely. I mean, right from people who are in Chikubo. Yes. You know, every time, sometimes I get time and I go downtown. Yes. And I sit and, and interact with the business community in Chikubo. And, and it's like, I think it's the pulse of, 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 of business in this, in this country. How does the budget support that Nomo Wanainchi in Chikubo, that businessman who is bringing in containers and, you know, how, is there a way the budget is tailored in a way to support that sector? Well, you know, the trade sector is complicated. You know that trade sector can also be uh, something that uh, ultimately undermines your growth. Because if you're looking at a country like Uganda, if you're importing a lot of finished products, it means we are exporting jobs actually. It means that we are supporting those economies. If I buy a shirt from China, complete, it means that job I've left in China. So as a trader, you're just making a small margin, but ultimately the loss and that is the argument around the refinery and oil and gas and so on and so forth. So trading is good and we like what the traders are doing. But ultimately it should be linked into the value chain of agriculture, agro-processing, and then you have a number of supportive industries. And then the traders come in as part of the value chain that's able to link products and services to the market. So for me, I would, if I were government, and I try to, they, they try to mention it here and there, they try to mention import substitution, export promotion, the president mentioned it as well. Let us make sure that we minimize our imports as much as possible and we support the development of homegrown uh, industries. And the people in, Chik and people in Chikubo, for me, I would say, you have a graduation program. My colleagues in Casita also mentioned they are trying to set up a graduation program whereby you trade for 10, 20 years, then you set up a factory. But you cannot perpetuate trade for 40 years. And then our colleagues are coming, they are setting up factories, all the factories are foreign owned. What are we doing as Uganda? We are not serious. We cannot make sure that we are in those, the least valuable parts of the value chain. We are in primary agriculture, non-commercialized, peasantry agriculture, subsistence agriculture, and then you're in petty trading. I don't think we, we want to grow the economy that way because these kinds of segments of the value chain don't create jobs, the decent kind of jobs that we want. So I think we like Chukubu and what it's doing, but we, we also must transition it so that it's able to support uh, the growth prospects of the economy. All right, let, on that issue, let me just quote what Matia Kasai just said, uh, the budget reading said, Madam Speaker, to make our industries more competitive and attract investment and remove the remaining barriers of trade among other African countries, we agreed that the ESC partner states to change the taxes paid on goods coming in outside the ESC as follows. 
zero duty levied on imports of raw materials and capital goods, 10% duty charged on import of intermediary goods, 25% duty charged on imports of finished goods not readily available in the region, and a maximum rate of 35% duty charged on imports of finished goods readily available in the region, and as well as small adjustments promote import substitution and value addition in our local industries. That's what you're saying. Exactly, because we are saying, why do you import a finished product into the ESC, yet there are factories that are making this within the region? So let's support the development of local industries. So the imposition of a 35% levy on goods that are coming in from into this the ESC region, yet they are readily available here, is the right move. The 25%, you import something that is not there, so that we give room for uh, so that we give room for local industries to develop. Then, if you charge 10% on intermediate goods, it's okay you may, because. Not everyone can start by transforming a raw material into a finished product. Maybe all you can do is get intermediate goods, add value, and then sell. That's fine. Let's charge you 10%. If you bring in raw materials, that's okay because they are needed in our factory. So th the point being, we must be extremely strategic in order to ensure that we build our industry base. Because you are signing all these agreements, ESC, COMESA, African Continental Free Trade Area, people must appreciate the African continent of free trade area, yes, it grants us access for a huge market of over a billion people, of over three trillion US dollars, but it's also a risk. These countries, some of these countries in this AFCFTA, are thorough. If you look at Algeria, if you look at Morocco, if you look at Egypt, they can wipe you out if you're not serious. You know? You're selling small juices, they are not branded, they are not, you, you won't manage. Those guys are serious uh, manufacturers. So I think we must build supplier capacity, even as we sign those agreements. Let's be intentional, because I see when we're talking about industrialization, it's industrial parks, industrial parks, investors, investors, investors. Where has this thing worked? So Where? You which country? You the US. Government is which, decision no, who, who, who invested in the US to, for it to develop? That's the question. Who invested in the UK for it to develop? You know, we shouldn't try to read things in the books and just try. I'm not saying the idea of an industry. You don't have capital investment. I'm not so saying investors to put money into look, the economy who, should be appreciated. Who? I'm not saying investors are not good. Please get me right. I'm saying your industrial strategy cannot be anchored on, on investment. foreign investment. No, it can't. Yes, they, are, they contribute, they are part of the world, they are part of contributors. They need to come for short periods of time. They come, you say, you know what, you have five to ten years, you know. Within that time, you have to train our people, you have to bring in equipment, you have to, and you have to come with your market. Eh? You have to come with your market. But you find an investor comes, they give him capital, they give him land, government even gives him market. So what has he brought? He then he even comes with his relatives as workers. Then your people, they are the ones opening the gate, they are just a reception. No, this, 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 this needs an overhaul, I'm telling you. Because we talk about backward and forward linkages. Industrial parks cannot be general. Industrial parks should be cluster-based. In our country, we say, okay, uh, in Bundibujo, what do we have? We have cocoa. We set up a small industrial park that works from cocoa beans to cocoa final products. All the machinery is there, all the people with the skills are there. You just get chocolate and export direct from Bundibuju, you see. But now, in a small country like this one, you cannot say you have 200 industrial parks. And then when you go to Soroti, you have to drive 20, 30 kilometers to an industrial park. Who is going to be there? Can a small business person go there? This is the challenge. And I think, when, I'm not saying, I'm not saying industry, in, foreign direct investment is not important, it's definitely important. But the way we go about it. And maybe we can do a pilot. Why, why do we roll out before we, we get one thing right? Let's get one, 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 one thing right. Let's focus on small industrial workspaces that are then linked to large industrial parks so that they are backward and forward linkages. That's another discussion. But I think we need to look, we need to reevaluate uh, our industrial strategy mm -hmm. and not just copy because, you know, China did it in uh, Shenzhen and so on, then therefore it has to work here. No. Mm. The, Chinese, uh, the Chinese circumstances 
may have been different. The circumstances in Singapore may have been different, particularly in the area of human resource. Because these are people who may have had the human resource, they just need, they just need some investment and stuff like that. But also the laws in terms of what are you allowed to do, what are you not allowed to do. If you look at the China model, for instance, it's, they, they, there's no, the government insists on knowledge transfer. So the Chinese are making cars now. But 20, 30 years ago, they were not making cars. If you look at India, the way it has developed its own car making industry, they were struggling. And then they brought in the Koreans. And then they insisted, source from our people, train them, don't bring your workers, don't bring your materials, just bring your knowledge. You bring your knowledge, we'll give you access to our market. Do everything from here. So in that way, they've built local capacity. Now the Indians are able to make nice cars. If you went to India maybe 15 years ago, you'd find all these old funny cars of Tata and so on. If you go there now, you find all these cars that are made there by Indians using. So it has catalyzed the whole value chain. Wow. Yes. So that's what we are saying. We are not opposed. And people shouldn't get us wrong and say, oh, John thinks investors are not useful. They are useful. But it's up to us to make sure that they are well regulated and they feed into our strategic uh, goals. Yeah, I, I hear you. What you are mentioning, I, I remember what South Africa did um, with the uh, manufacturing of vaccines. BioVac as a company, um, the deal, what South Africa did is they gave um, a deal to one of these, the big farmers to come and set up and transfer knowledge. Within five years, they gave them uh, monotony in the market for five years. But after five years, BioVac should have developed its capacity to continue the supply chain. And, and now, South Africa is one of the countries that is producing vaccines for the entire continent because there was some sort of technology transfer. So it sort of rings a bell. In yeah, India. and then there are sectors you need to ring fence. You see, I cannot go to India, for instance, and I start a show. It's illegal. It's illegal, I cannot. There are specific sectors, Australia, the UK, the Canada, they have what they call skill-based visas. So as people come in, they say, what's your skill? I'm a man olive oil graduate. No, you are, there's nothing you're going to add to our economy. You stay. We want someone who is between these years, working age. You must be between 18 to 35. You must have a postgraduate qualification in these areas. These are the areas where we need skills. But do we even know the critical skills we need in Uganda? Do we know? We don't. We don't. So in, anyone can come into Uganda, and that's a pity. You know? So we must make sure that we have a sieve yeah. for our investors. Who are the investors that we want? Which are the sectors where we need investment? What do we need from them? Where should we source them from? And so on and so forth. Yeah, I, I hear you. Even though, I mean, in the world of investment, you are competing with other countries that are providing even a more conducive environment for investors. So a sort of capital competition from your neighbors who yeah, but invest are creating all these spaces for them to come and invest money in their economies. Yeah, yeah, but you see, that's the mistake that African countries make. Huh? Investors are most interested in the cost of doing business and the conduciveness of the business environment, not in incentives. They're not, no, no serious investor is looking for free land. No serious investor is looking for financial grants. They are looking at the market. They are looking at stability. They are looking at the potential to get skilled personnel. If you make these things right, if they have a commercial dispute, they want to be able to go to the commercial court and it's resolved within months. They don't want to spend years going following up on a case. They don't want to find that the, the court clerk lost the file. They don't want to ask for a, a yakamita and it takes two months. They don't want to you know, so these are, they want to move on smooth roads, you know. So no serious investor is looking for one square mile in the middle of nowhere to put up I don't know what. So what we are saying is let's work on these things. Let, because if we say we are going to use incentives as a primary goal of attracting investors, it's the race to the bottom. We can't win it. Wow. John, let's talk about expenditure. Money. We've collected this money. We've talked about where this money is going to come from, yes. how government is going to spend it. Your thoughts on government expenditure? Well, overall, I think the priorities are okay. And I think they are aligned with what government has been prioritizing in the past. 
you see government prioritizing uh, human capital development, giving that sector about nine trillion. Uh, government uh, prioritizing issues around governance and security gives them another nine trillion. Uh, private sector development, I think, gets about two there about, uh, which is a pity because that's where the money comes from. You know, uh, then uh, you see them also investing in uh, infrastructure, which is the, the right thing uh, to do. So in terms of the overall priorities, I would say I'm okay. You know, agro-industrialization, private sector development, infrastructure, human capital development. My concern is, eh, under human capital development, I still see a lot of equipment so, and, and hardware. So human capital development is meant to work on the software. Ministry of Education. Yes, but when you go there, you find now we are building more schools. You, have, you see, just say, let's look at vocational education. Building more schools that don't necessarily improve the quality of your vocational training system. Obviously, it's good to have good infrastructure, it's good to have machines, but if you have no trainers, you know, if you, you find that uh, most of the machines are still covered with buvera, like, I don't know if you, I've gone to a number of vocational institutions, it's new, the machinery is new, the machinery is covered with Cavera for two, three years. Every because time no, one, no, no one knows how to operate it. No one knows how to operate it. I've seen some of those as well. So I think for me what I would like under human capital is the software bit of this, not so much the hardware. You know, let's stop getting obsessed about hardware. Across the board, even when you go under agro-industrialization, it's about irrigation, this, hardware, buying, 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 physical, 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 physical. No, I don't think that is where the solution is. It's, it's a good thing that we have these things, but I don't think um, in themselves they're the solution. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Wasteful expenditure. You talked about that aspect of going on holiday and spending, and we have people in this country who drive cars of 1.6 billion. That's true. And yet we are squeezing a normal SME to pay taxes, to buy for people cars. Yeah. Wasteful expenditure in this country. It sometimes disturbs me. No, I think they are, they are making efforts, of course. You see now the issue of saying we are not buying any new cars, we are not going to invest in trips abroad, no workshops, no this. I think that's a good start, but we want to see a more, a, a, a more complete overhaul. When we were the PSST sometime, he mentioned that ministries have been having what they call retooling. Eh? They have a line called retooling. Under retooling, they have built all these nice skyscrapers. I don't know if you're seeing every agency now has a skyscraper. ERA has a skyscraper. National Drug Authority has a skyscraper. It's too big. How can they occupy it? I don't know who occupies those floors. Because you, <laughs> it's too big. National, you can have, I don't know, 15, 17 stories skyscraper. So every agency now has. Insurance Regulatory Authority has its own skyscraper. Uh, IGG is building its own skyscraper. So he mentioned that now he's, uh, he's stopped this. I think we need to be modest. You can't have an economy where it's only the government building the newest and shiniest uh, skyscrapers. No, that has to be the work of the private sector. So if we go into this budget and look at those lines where people are hiding money and are able to retrieve it and use it for the general good, I think that would be a, a, a very good thing. All right, John, are you optimistic about the next financial year? I am optimistic. Things are getting better. Inflation is coming down. Uh, we are seeing businesses that have been struggling for some time starting to find stability. Uh, obviously, we've also been having issues around uh, the geopolitical situation, especially in our neighborhood. You know, we have a war now in Sudan, and Sudan has been one of our biggest buyers for our coffee, and coffee is one of our biggest exports. So these other things that may not be written here may affect uh, the prospects of growth and of the economy in the coming year. But I think overall, Ugandans need to be optimistic. Things are getting better. Some countries are worse. You know, if you look at the UK, for instance, they were talking about capping prices for commodity. By the time the UK talks about capping, prices, then you understand that these are, are very serious things. The U.S. is raising the debt ceiling 
again and again and again. So if you look at a lot of, if you look at the- Central banks are meeting to manage inflation. Exactly, if you look at the EU, eh, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are having strikes, cost of living crisis and stuff like that. So yes, we have challenges, but if you look at the size of our economy, I think we are trying, and Ugandans ought to be optimistic. I'm not in government, but from my vantage point, I have a lot of optimism. What's your conclusion? Well, my conclusion uh, is that um, we, have a, we, have a, we have a good country. Uh, we are blessed in very many ways. Uh, in many ways, this is the best country in the world. Uh, Ugandans don't appreciate it and, until they go for some time and then they say, let me go back home because it's a nice country. So I think all of us need to uh, play our roles well. Those in the private sector, if you're running a business, your role is to employ people, your role is to pay taxes. If you're in government, your role is to manage your money well. Don't misuse it. It's not your money, you, it's not your private company. You are managing our country on our behalf. Please do it well. Uh, if you're a doctor, please also discharge that duty well so that this country moves well uh, for future generations. Thank you. John Walugembe Kakunglu, thank you for speaking to us. You're welcome. Well, I have been speaking with John Walugembe Kakunguru, who is an economist, but he's also the executive director at the Federation for Small and Medium Enterprises. I'm Solomon Serwanja. Like John, let me stay optimistic. This is the hard questions. <laughs>